Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, so I just wanted to give Michelle a brief introduction. Um, so Michelle Kroll is the Civil War and Reconstruction Specialist in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress where she currently oversees the papers of President James K. Polk to Theodore Roosevelt. She is the author of several articles and books on topics relating to the Civil War, as well as Quantico, Virginia, and the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C. And prior to joining the Library of Congress, she has worked at the Historical Society of Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia Community College, and as a research assistant for historian Doris Kearns Goodwin. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Michelle as she discusses the Theodore Roosevelt materials in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress. I'm just putting my timer here, so I'll make sure I, I don't go over my allotted time with you all. As Rachel just said, my name is Michelle Krell, and I work in the Manuscript Division of the Library of Congress. And before joining the staff at the Manuscript Division, um, as she mentioned, I was a research assistant for historian Doris Kearns Goodwin, and was fortunate enough to be involved in the early research for her book, The Bully Pulpit, which is about Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, and the muckraking journalists that you just heard from Mr. Brewster. Um, through Doris, I came to love TR, so when a new curator was needed for the Roosevelt Papers at the library, I volunteered, and luckily when we got a new 20th century specialist, she already knew my affection for TR, so she graciously let me keep him, which is why I'm here today. <coughs> so the Library of Congress has an embarrassment of riches when it comes to Theodore Roosevelt materials. We have significant collections of people's personal papers like TR, we have his hunting library, we have photographs, cartoons, and other visual illustrations of TR and his world. We have motion pictures, recorded sound, sheet music, as well as a huge collection of newspapers, journals, and other printed materials. And with so much material uh, throughout the Library of Congress, I could go on and on for hours, but since I only really have one hour, I'm just picked some of my personal favorites to talk to you about today. So some of the stories may or may not be familiar to you, depending on how familiar you are with TR, but here are some of the documents and the visuals that go behind the stories. And in addition to the content of some of the letters, I've also tried to include a number that show uh, TR's letterhead over the span of his very career. So that's another feature that can be of interest to you if you want to see, all right, wh what is his job and where is he writing from and how does his letterhead change? But first I want to mention how the Library of Congress came to have such a magnificent collection of Theodore Roosevelt's papers. So TR had forged a close relationship with the Library of Congress throughout his presidency and beyond. And in December 1916, TR wrote to Librarian of Congress Herbert Putnam and that he and his wife Edith had talked over, what he said, over the disposition of my great mass of papers. They include in immense numbers copies of my letters and of letters to me while I was president, and also letters from sovereigns, et cetera, et cetera. They ought to be in the Congressional Library. And that's how the initial donation came to the Library of Congress. When the first boxes arrived at the library, they were locked and they didn't have a key. So a representative sent a very detailed letter about why they were locked and what had happened and all of this and the whole explanation of the situation. But in typical TR fashion, Roosevelt told Putnam emphatically, the Lord only knows where the key is. Break the cases open and start to work on them. He just wanted his papers open. He didn't care about the boxes. So over the years, more materials arrived from a variety of sources to form the Theodore Roosevelt papers, and the library continues to add to that collection when it's possible to do so. But TR is, is not just found in his own papers, and if you're doing research, this is an important thing to remember. You have to think, who did that person write to, and where does that letter end up? So his correspondence is in the collections of individuals to whom he wrote, and as are observations about TR written by other people who encountered him. So TR can be found in other Roosevelt collections in the manuscript division, including those of his children, Ted, Kermit, Archie, and Alice Roosevelt. 
and in the collections of his contemporaries, including William Howard Taft, Jacob Rees, Elihu Root, William Allen White, Ray Stannard Baker, James R. Garfield, Gifford Pinchot, Owen Wister, John Hay, and so many, many more. And um, on each slide, you'll hopefully be able to see, it's a little bit hard to see with the white type, but the, collection, the name of the collection that specific item comes from. So if you're interested in following up on any of these things, you may know where they came from. And as we go through, my apologies, I may skip some slides because in my exuberance to include so much, I kind of outpaced my ability to talk fast enough to stay within the allotted time. So without further ado, let's get to the archives. So while the collections of the Library of Congress best record Theodore Roosevelt's adult life and career, one of the gems of the TR papers is a series of seven pocket diaries that kept by TR between 1878 and 1884, and that's when he's kind of in his late teens, early 20s. In 1878, TR's beloved father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., or Thee, died while TR was a student at Harvard. On the day that Thee died, February 9, 1878, TR inked, inked a heavy black, black border on the left side of the diary entry in the pocket diary. And you can see it here. And one thing I'll note, and I'll just say this very loudly to project, is that it's a little bit hard to see because at the time they were using what was called iron gall ink, and it's very acidic. And so sometimes the ink, when it's very heavy, it actually eats through the paper. So that's what's happened over time, is that the paper has, has deteriorated because of the ink that he used. But for months after Thee's death, TR recorded his father's many virtues, his own guilt for not living up to Thee's examples, and his anguish at losing the man he called the best man I ever knew. And in June 2019, Dr. Carla Hayden, who is our current Librarian of Congress, viewed this 1878 diary in the Manuscript Division and was struck, as most of us are, with the poignancy of TR's words. And these last images of Dr. Hayden with the diary were posted on her Twitter feed in honor of Father's Day. TR's pocket diaries also record his falling in love with Alice Hathaway Lee, a young Boston beauty he met through friends at Harvard. TR vowed to marry her, and even though Alice rejected him at least once, maybe more, um, but TR ultimately prevailed, and he and Alice were engaged in January of 1880. And with his usual restraint, and I say that very tongue in cheek, TR reflects on his love for Alice in this entry on Friday, February 13, 1880. She is so marvelously sweet and pure and lovable and pretty that I seem to love her more and more every time I see her, although I love her so much now that I really cannot love her more. I do not think ever a man loved a woman more than I love her. For a year and a quarter now, I have never, even when hunting, gone to sleep or waked up without thinking of her, and I doubt if an hour has passed that I have not thought of her, and now I can scarcely realize that I can hold her in my arms and kiss her and caress her and love her as much as I choose. So I think he's kind of in love. TR and Alice married on his 22nd birthday, October 27, 1880, and for several years they lived happily as TR attended law school, wrote a history of the Naval War of 1812, began a promising career in New York politics. And on February 12, 1884, they became the, ba the parents of a baby girl. But their happiness was not to last. Alice's condition deteriorated following her daughter's birth. TR raced home from the state legislature in Albany only to find that both his wife and mother were dying in the same house at the same time. So TR tore himself away from Alice's side just long enough to share a few parting moments with his mother before she died of typhoid fever on the morning of February 14, 1884 at the age of 48. That afternoon, his wife Alice died at the age of 22, probably from an undiagnosed kidney ailment. TR recorded his, her death in his pocket diary with a huge black X and the lament, the light has gone out of my life. On the subsequent pages of this 1884 diary, TR recorded the essentials of Alice's life and his, their life together, noting that I wooed her for over a year before I won her. We spent three years of happiness, greater and more unalloyed than I have ever known, but that on February 14th, she died in my arms. Then he also notes the dual blow of his wife and his mother dying in the same house on the same day, which was Valentine's Day, and the double funeral that the family held in Greenwood Cemetery. 
And then he concluded, for joy or for sorrow, my life has now been lived out. And at the time, Theodore Roosevelt was only 25 years old. But if TR's life had truly been lived out at 25, we wouldn't be here. Although he returned to his legislative duties in Albany, he soon departed for the Badlands in North Dakota, where he had invested in cattle ranches on the Little Missouri River. And in 1902, he documented the three brands that he used for his cattle. So that's what you see on the left-hand side, that for his ranches, the Maltese Cross, the Elkhorn, and the Triangle, those were the brands that his cattle were branded with. The Badlands allowed TR to leave behind almost all reminders of his wife, Alice, including their daughter, Alice, baby, or what they called Baby Lee, to whom his sister, Bammy, became a surrogate mother for the next several years. While cattle ranching nearly bankrupted TR, it proved a salvation in other ways. He met and he won the respect of cowboys and other Westerners, some of whom would later join him in other battles. And you just kind of have to imagine this bespectacled, um, uh, very erudite New Yorker, you know, charging out into the Badlands and what some of these cowboys thought about him. But as he recalled in a 1908 letter to his son Ted, that when I was ranching on the Little Missouri, I got along excellent with everyone. I worked hard with them on the roundup. I participated with hearty interest in different political meetings. I took part in the work of the Cattlemen's Association, and they gained a respect for him as well as he did for them. He also gained an appreciation for the natural environment in places other than New York and on the East Coast where he had been. And he submerged his grief over Alice through hard work and physical exhaustion. Black care rarely sits behind a writer whose pace is fast enough, he had famously observed in an 1888 book. After Roosevelt later became famous, one of his modest ranch houses, presumably the Maltese Cross Ranch, was actually picked up and displayed at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, which TR visited while President of the United States. I didn't have a chance to, to look to see whether he went and visited his old ranch while he was at the World's Fair, which must have been kind of odd if he did. But later, the Maltese Cross Ranch cabin was as the subject of a historic American building survey, which documented the structure and its later modifications from an architectural perspective. So if any of you are interested in architecture and the built environment, these cab studies are a great way of seeing the architectural features and engineering of some of our historic buildings. But TR found love again with his childhood sweetheart, Edith Corot, whom he married in December 1886. Baby Lee joined the family, which eventually expanded to six children, all of whom you can see here in this photograph with their parents. And from left to right, they're Quentin, Ted, Archie, Alice, Kermit, and Ethel. So TR settled comfortably into married life and relished fatherhood, although with TR being as rambunctious as he was of personality as any of the children, Edith may have thought sometimes she had seven children rather than actually six. And as his friend, the British diplomat Cecil Springrice famously said, you must always remember that the president is about six. TR also resumed an active public life, including service on the United States Civil Service Commission, which aimed to phase out the use of government jobs as political patronage and actually bring in people who were qualified for their jobs rather than they just donated to a political party. So that responsibility kept him in Washington during the summer of 1890 after his family returned here to Oyster Bay and prompted this letter to the nearly three-year-old Ted, and obviously this letter is going to be read to him by his mother. And I like to use this, this document in displays because you can just use this one document to tell a lot of things about Theodore Roosevelt at this time. So if you look at the letterhead, he's on the United States Civil Service Commission, which means that he's a government reformer. You can also see that he's a devoted father because he's writing this cute little letter to Ted. He also has an appreciation for the natural world, and he's a pretty decent artist at the same time. And so this moral, and you see some of these picture letters throughout some of the, the collections of the Roosevelt children, so this also carries a little, a little moral. A pony and a cow go out to see the world. They meet a bear and are much frightened. He chases them back just as hard as they can run, and when they get home in safety, they make up their minds that they will never run away again. Well, I don't think staying home in safety was a lesson that TR ever learned himself, but there you go. And here's another picture letter that TR wrote to Ted in 1893, and it reflects the family's names for the children as bunnies. So if you ever come across TR or Roosevelt family letters, there's a lot about the, the bunnies. 
and sometimes they're animals and sometimes they're the children. TR responds to news of Ted's illness and rec by recalling having the measles in college. He says, then I had to stay in bed and the other boys would come solemnly in and look at me and they all they would say to comfort me was, gracious Theodore, you do look spotted. And then he draws a little picture of them coming in. And of course, one of them smoking on the right hand side. So I'm not sure that really helped his measles a whole lot. In 1895, TR accepted a position as president of the New York City Police Commission, and he went about his new responsibilities with predictable gusto. He was concerned about weeding out corruption in the police department and the lackluster performances by some of the beat cops. So he hit the streets at night, and he was often guided by journalist Jacob Reese, who uh, was the author of How the Other Half Lives. So this is another way that TR was cultivating journalists on behalf of democratic policy. Um, procedures. And so the two of them went on what they called midnight rambles to root out pro problem practices and cops to be dealt with in daylight hours. So they would just literally go walk the streets of New York City at night to find out what cops were actually on their beats and what was happening. TR had great fun and he made even greater copy for the newspaper. And soon he would be depicted in cartoons only by his oval glasses and his prominent teeth. And of course, good newspaper coverage brought TR, uh, attention to TR and his activities on the commission. So the Theodore Roosevelt Papers in the Manuscript Division includes a whole, no, a whole host of scrapbooks about periods of TR's life, including his time as police commissioner. And of the many cartoons, this one is actually my favorite. It's labeled, The Combination Was Too Much for the Cop, and it depicts a New York City policeman startled by advertisements for opticians and dentists on Roosevelt Street that looked a little bit too much like the police commissioner coming around the corner on a midnight ramble. And TR's desire to know the reality of subjects under his administration would continue in his future political positions. When he was governor of New York, TR wrote to his friend Jacob Reese in 1900, suggesting an in-person investigation of sweatshops in New York. I think perhaps that if I looked through the sweatshops myself with the inspectors as well as look over their work, we might be in a condition to put a new things on a new basis, just as they were put on a new basis in the police department after you and I began our midnight tours. So he wasn't just taking everybody else's word for things, he wanted to see how this all worked for himself. Another characteristic of TR's clearly seen in his work on the police commission is his dislike of either practical or political restraints on his ability to act. So as he explained to his friend Cecil Springrice, my work here goes on with the usual worry and friction, which I do not mind. But what I do mind is the growing tendency among all the politicians to wrap bands around me so that I cannot do anything. If they do not give me proper power by legislation, I shall stay here until I get some honorable reason for leaving, for I extremely dislike accepting responsibility unaccompanied by power. So this is no just paper pushing bureaucrat who's just getting a, a paycheck. TR found an honorable way to get out of uh, the police commission after William McKinley won the presidency in 1896 and TR's supporters facilitated his appointment in 1897 as assistant secretary of the Navy. And if you care, this is Cecil Spring Rice, who was one of TR's best friends. They met on a transatlantic voyage in 1886. He was TR's best man, and they wrote constantly throughout the rest of their lives. So this particular document is a lesson in be careful who you leave in charge when you go out of town for a day or more. So when TR was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, his boss, the, assist, the Secretary of the Navy, liked to take very long vacations during the summer, and he left TR in charge thinking, okay, he's just an underling, he'll take everything and you know, he'll do what I want him to do. And TR thought, ah, now I'm in charge and I can get some things done. So he wrote, he, crow, he crowed to John Hay, my chief has been taking a holiday for two months, so I have been steadily in Washington, but I have really greatly enjoyed it, for I have been able to do two or three things in the department, which I have long really wished to do. So TR is an expansionist in a time where uh, the United States is just getting its reach into the global, the global world, and there's no aircraft yet, so naval power is really what makes the difference. So when TR is acting Secretary of the Navy, he's issuing orders and getting people on footings and really, you know, sort of helping to expand the Navy. And he even does that one afternoon in 1898 as, we're get, as the United States was getting closer to war with, with Spain. 
literally Secretary Long goes out for a few hours and all of a sudden he's putting you know, the fleet on war readiness. So I don't know if some of you might know the name John Hay if you're at all in, interested in Abraham Lincoln. And this John Hay is the same John Hay that 30 years earlier had been one of Abraham Lincoln's private secretaries at the White House. And so TR was really an admirer of Abraham Lincoln. So his long friendship with John Hay was another way that the two administrations had this link. So as relations between the U.S. and Spain heated up over the Spanish administration of Cuba, TR was definitely among the chorus who were supporting American intervention. Although he told Attorney, uh, Attorney Elihu Root that the question was, the honor of this country demands war unless the Spaniards at once surrender on the question of the independence of Cuba. It was really also, so TR was perhaps genuinely interested in what was happening to Cubans under Spanish rule, but he really wanted to go to war. He was really itching for his crowded hour of military glory. Once the U.S. did go to war with Spain, TR planned to resign as Assistant Secretary of the Navy and then join the land forces in a cavalry regiment. And although TR was most responsible for organizing the unit known as the Rough Riders, the colonelcy was wisely given to someone with more experience, his friend Leonard Wood. But as this letter to Wood amply demonstrates, TR did not remain a silent second in command. He was instead active at getting supplies and anxious to participate directly. So he tells Wood, I have been rushing around all day making the lives of the Quartermaster General and the Chief of the Bureau of Ordnance a burden to them, he explained, before launching into this whole series of what he had been doing to try to get the Rough Riders um, organized and supplied. And, but on the second page, he betrays his own desire to be at the front. He says, I suppose you'll be keeping me here for several days longer, but there is one thing, old man, you mustn't do, and that is run any risk of having me left when the regiment starts to Cuba. Of course, I know you wouldn't do it intentionally, but remember that at any cost, I must have a chance to get with you before you start. So he is just anxious to get to war for a variety of reasons we could talk about in the Q&A later. <clears throat> The library's prints and photographs division has a number of images of TR during the Spanish-American War, including both posed for portraits and more informal camp scenes. And I'll just mention that this actually wasn't a regulation uniform for a lieutenant colonel in the cavalry. He actually ordered this himself from Brooks Brothers. Because, you know, even when you're, when you're conscious of your image, you want to look right. And can any presentation that includes TR in Cuba not include this group portrait of the Rough Riders after the charges of Kettle Up Kettle Up Hill and San Juan Hill? Okay, I'm gonna go past that one. So TR continued to out look out for his Rough Riders and Spanish American War veterans, as indicated by this humorous opening in a letter to Secretary of War Elihu Root, who clearly received many more communications from TR about doing favors for the veterans than other issues. So he says, your pain at receiving a letter from me will be mitigated when I explain it has nothing in the world to do with the Rough Riders, not a commission for a gallant volunteer in the Philippines, nor with the application of a worthy comrade who served beside me at, San at Santiago. So he's always trying to do favors and get a pension or do something for these, these men with whom he served. And in this case, he was actually forwarding a letter from the sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens regarding the location in New York City of a, of a statue Gaudens had, St. Gaudens had done of Civil War General William Tecumseh Sherman. So kind of an appealing aspect about this short letter is that it confirms that TR is looking after his rough riders to the annoyance of everyone around him, that he has a sense of humor about it, but also that practically in the same breath, he's then moving on to the artistic merits of a statue and where it should be located. Perhaps a less attractive side of TR's military service is his clear desire to receive a Medal of Honor for his active e and his active efforts to secure one. And at the time, because of the regulations of how Medals of Honor were given, you actually could even nominate yourself, and they were kind of a little loosey-goosey about how they were giving them out. But documentation of his desire to get one of these medals um, is a statement by E.G. Norton in support of Roosevelt's leadership during the Spanish-American War. And while the statement might be signed by Norton, pretty much all of that handwriting at the bottom is all TRs. So he's actively participating in all this. Didn't help because he never did get his Medal of Honor. So TR and the Republicans parlayed his wartime service into his election as governor of the state of New York, which he celebrated in a letter to his friend Springy. 
I knew you would be pleased with my success. I have played it in bull luck this summer, first to get into the war, and then to get out of it, and then to get elected. I have worked hard all my life and have never been particularly lucky, but this summer I was lucky, and I am enjoying it to the full. I am more than contented to be governor of New York and shall not care if I never hold another office. Well, as we all know, that bit about not caring if you ever, <laughs> ever held another office um, wasn't really true, but he really did seem to enjoy his time as governor. So the phrase, speak softly and carry a big stick, is so associated with Theodore Roosevelt that it's easy to forget he didn't actually originate it. In this letterpress copy of a January 1900 letter to Henry Sprague, we see the first known use by TR of the phrase when he writes, I have always been fond of the West African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far, in reference to his coolness with regards to his opponents. And how many of you have ever heard of letterpress before? audience. All right, so what you do in the era before you've got copy machines or you've got things that you can just make a carbon copy of is if you write a letter to someone and you send it, you won't have that copy anymore so you don't know what you sent. So if you put a damp piece of tissue paper on it and literally press the tissue into the letter, the ink from the original letter absorbs up into the tissue enough that you'll be able to read it. That's what's happening here. And so that's how Theodore Roosevelt and other people like him are keeping copies of their letters so that they know what they've written to other people. So that's a little history of office supplies for you. In 1900, TR was added to the Republican ticket as the vice presidential candidate to the incumbent William McKinley. The New York political bosses encouraged this to get the activist governor out of New York and out of their business because TR as governor had a lot of power and he was trying to, to do some reforming. And these people want him out of New York, so they think, we'll make him vice president. That'll mean he can't do anything at all. As we'll see, TR was less than thrilled about that prospect. And I, all, I added this not only to kind of break out some of the documents, but just to show you how vibrant some of the, the political posters could be from previous political campaigns. So I'm going to go through that one. So TR reiterated his sentiments on the, on the vice president to his friend Springy, saying, I would have preferred to have continued as governor, but the nomination came unanimously and with such a demand that it was out of the question to refuse it, for it was believed that I could greatly strengthen the ticket in the West. States, TR recorded in a prophetic statement to his old commander, Leonard Wood, you know that the vice presidency is an utterly anomalous office, when I, which I think ought to be abolished. The man who occupies it may at any moment be everything, but meanwhile he is practically nothing. And at the time, that's essentially it. You presided over the Senate, but it wasn't much of a relationship with the president. But then TR became everything. William McKinley died of an assassin's bullet September 14, 1901, and, um, after Leon, anarchist Leon Shogosh shot uh, McKinley at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. And McKinley's death then made Theodore Roosevelt president just months into their, their administration. And still, TR is the youngest man to serve as the president of the United States. While TR pledged to follow his predecessor's policies, he courted controversy almost immediately. 
So you can see that this is September 14, 1901. So William McKinley, this is the day that McKinley dies. And TR is already writing to Booker T. Washington, who at the time is one of the foremost African Americans at the time and someone who is sort of a recognized leader of the black community. And he wants to invite Booker, Wa Booker T. Washington to come meet about political appointments. And so they make arrangements so he can come to Washington and ultimately he has dinner with Theodore Roosevelt and some of his family members on October 16th, 1901. But as you might imagine, Booker T. Washington is black, Theodore Roosevelt is white, and Southerners go berserk. So this just months, just you know, like a, a month or so into his administration, they're already writing about this, this dinner that he's had and how awful it is. And again, white Southerners just go, go crazy that, that TR has, has gone over the segregation line that way. So even though he had warm friends in the South, he's already sort of lost a little bit of his support. But on some level, TR doesn't entirely care because as he wrote to his newspaper friend in Chicago, I am much saddened by the views of the South in reference to Booker T. Washington, but of course it will not make me alter my policy. So they might not have dinner together again, but we do know that Booker T. Washington did meet with Theodore Roosevelt again because we can find evidence of it in his 1902 desk diary. <clears throat> so here again, we see that in 1902, Booker T. Washington came at noon to meet with the president. What we can also see from these desk diaries is the day that, uh, that United Mine Workers uh, labor leader John Mitchell and some of the mine operators came to visit TR while they were trying to get to resolve a coal strike. So in 1902, coal was what you used to heat your house. And if you're a coal miner, you're not working under good con working conditions, you don't have a lot of support. So the, the, mine, the miners went out on strike and the mine operators refused to budge at all. So TR had them try to come together and, and broker some sort of negotiation and they came to visit him. He wasn't living at the White House at the time because it was being renovated, but they came to the house that he was living in. And he was, that same day, he wrote to Mark Hanna, who's a Republican political uh, operative, well, I have tried and failed. I feel downhearted over the result, both because of the great misery ensuing for the mass of our people and because the attitude of the operators will be beyond a doubt double the burden on us who stand between them and socialistic action. So again, think about what the alternative could, could have been if they didn't come to an agreement. They could have been a lot more radical response instead. But I am glad I tried anyhow. I should have hated to feel that I had failed to make any effort. What my next move will be, I cannot say. I feel most strongly that the attitude of the operators is one which accentuates the need of the government having some power of supervision and regulation over corporations. I would like to make a fairly radical experiment on the anthracite coal business to start with. And here we're getting back to the issue of government regulation. There wasn't a lot of regu government regulation of businesses at the time, and we're moving into a progressive era under TR when he's going to get more and more into trying to regulate corporations that had been operating pretty freely. So some of the issues that we're talking about today have a lot of resonance back in, back in the past. And that's where we get to this Clifford Berryman cartoon. So one of the things that TR tried to do is separate out what corporation or trusts, and that's when several companies who deal with the same sort of product get together and try to manipulate prices and practices. So TR would try to look at a trust and say, is this trust operating on behalf of the public good? Then maybe we'll consider that a good trust and just tame it with a leash. If it's a bad trust, it must be destroyed. And so you can kind of see him in his little Rough Rider outfit. He's got, he's taming the good trusts and then killing the bad ones. And just in case any of you are interested in political cartoonists, even without the signature at the bottom, you can tell that this is a Clifford Berryman cartoon because if you look over on the right-hand side, there's a little bear holding a bag. Well, that is the, the signature of Clifford Berryman because he's making a play on his last name, Berryman. And he's also the one that created the first cartoon that inspired TR as a teddy bear. The 1902 coal strike negotiations came at a time when TR was recovering from a serious accident. Uh, his, one of his carriages had been hit by um, a locomotive, a, a, a train, a piece of train equipment that had actually killed his Secret Service agent. And so he was really severely wounded and was in a wheelchair at that point and not very mobile. 
and he explained to the Librarian of Congress, Herbert Putnam, as I lead, to put it mildly, a sedentary life for the moment, I would greatly like some books that would appeal to my queer tastes. I do not suppose there are any histories or any articles upon the early Mediterranean races. That man, Lindsay, who wrote about prehistoric Greece has not put out a second volume, has he? Has a second volume of Oman's Art of War appeared? If so, send me either or both. If not, then a good translation of Niebuhr or Monson or the best modern history of Mesopotamia. Is there a good history of Poland? This is what TR reads for fun. So when you're looking at the library to see what is this guy reading, this is what it is. And I'm impressed with this because I'm a very slow reader, but within two days, TR comes back with a book report, basically. And although this, public, this book, the letter's a little bit long, I want to quote almost in the entirety because it says so much about TR and his curious mind, and plus it shows that connection with the Library of Congress. So I'll read it kind of quickly. I owe you much. You sent me exactly the books I wished. I am now reveling in Maspero and occasionally make a deviation into Sergi's theories about the Mediterranean races, and I'm girding up my loins to try to believe that the Greeks and Romans in an infinitely remote past came from Africa instead of Asia, as I was taught in my simple youth. But I do not like the Poland. It is too short. I wanted to look up some of the details of the war of Gustavus Adolphus with the Poles, as seen from the Polish standpoint, and also some of the particulars of the Mongol invasion. It has been such a delight to drop everything useful, everything that referred to my duty, everything, for instance, relating to the coal strike and the tariff or the trusts or my powers to send troops into the mining districts or my duty as regards summoning Congress and to spend an afternoon in reading about the relations between Assyria and Egypt, which could not possibly do me any good and for which I reveled in accordingly. While my wife, who prefers Bell Letters, has read Shakespeare, which she has brought down, and Tennyson, which Ethel has brought down. I have been reading Thackeray, Dickens, and Scott myself recently, and felt as if I simply had to enjoy a few days of history. So this is what the president is reading while he's trying to deal with the coal strike and the trust, and he just has such a voracious appetite for reading and such a curious mind. And I say this as a historian, how can you not love someone who just says, I had to spend a couple of days with history? But it wasn't only history and reading that attracted TR. He loved the natural environment as well. And in March 1903, TR wrote to John Muir, who was the biggest champion of Yosemite Valley in California, and asked about going, or basically asked if, T, if John Muir would take him camping, which he did. So they went camping, TR enjoyed this immensely, and possibly could have furthered his, in, his support of protecting the national environment and creating more national parks. So as he wrote to Muir later, I trust I need not tell you, my dear sir, how happy were the days in Yosemite I owed to you and how greatly I appreciated them. I shall never forget our three camps, first in the solemn temple of the giant sequoias and the next in the snowstorm among the silver firs near the brink of the cliff and the third on the floor of the Yosemite in the open valley fronting the stupendous rocky mass of El Capitan with the falls thundering in the distance on either hand. So not bad for a, a, a simple little letter there. And of course, out of this trip comes the famous photograph of Theodore Roosevelt and John Muir at Yosemite. It also inspired a children's book by Arthur Bob Rosenstock, who imagines what probably or could have happened on this camping trip and how this camping trip inspired, potentially inspired TR to support more national parks. So don't forget the children's books when you're dealing with, with history because A, they're, they're often very fun and this is a way of, of introducing kids to history. But it wasn't only TR for whom the camping trip had left a powerful impression. This is a letter from John Muir to TR uh, just a few days after he left the White House in 1909. Or actually, this is in 1908, so he's still in the White House. I have had a delightful time with John Burroughs in Arizona and hope soon to have the pleasure of guiding him through the Yosemite National Park, recall, recalling our glorious camping trip of 1903. Somehow the whole country seems lonesome to me since you left Washington and are so soon to sail for Africa. And so here's the great man in 1904 as he's gearing up for a presidential campaign. And in our Kermit Roosevelt papers, we have a bunch of ephemera about that campaign. So this is a telegram that TR sent to his son Kermit to let him know that it looked good like he was going to win the election. So this is one way when you don't have the internet, you don't have Facebook or Instagram or any of these things, this is one way that you, you write quickly to your, your family or friends or relatives. You send a telegram. We also have invitations to the inauguration of, of TR on his own right and a program. 
And if I had, the, and the Library of Congress actually holds a number of motion pictures and four recordings of Theodore Roosevelt that document some of his life, including his inauguration in March 4th, 1905. So if I had learned in time how to make a film clip smaller and embedded in a PowerPoint, we would have watched a little bit. But here's what the screen will look like if you watch it in class or at home. But I'm really good at screen captures, so at least I can, and it's a silent film anyway, so it's not like you're missing a whole lot of, of, of action. But uh, so what you can see from these film clips is, look at the flags. It is an incredibly windy day on March 4th, 1905, and when you're watching it, all the palm fronds are going, and the ladies in their gigantic hats are trying to hold their hats down so the, the hats don't go whizzing off. You can also t see T.R. take his oath of office as the president in his own right. You can also see him giving his inaugural address. You can also see what he's holding as part of his inaugural speech. So sometimes we get asked questions. So what are they holding? Are they memorizing or are they looking at it? So you can t see T.R. is probably using cards that have his inaugural address on it, and he's having to refer to them periodically as he's, he's talking to the crowd. And remember, there's no amplification at that point, so he's actually having to just project into the crowd below. The films also show the, the inaugural parade uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue. So you can see the Capitol at the very far. And if any of you are familiar with Washington, D.C., that building with the columns on the left is the Willard Hotel. And you can also see T.R. actually in his own inaugural parade. But the issue that absorbed TR throughout his presidency was the creation of the Panama Canal. So think about how shipping moves now. And if you're in the Atlantic Ocean, how do you get to the Pacific Ocean if there is no Panama Canal? You have to go all the way around the tip of South America, which is both dangerous and costly. And if you're someone who's interested in naval power, how do you get your fleet from one ocean to another? Same thing. So for TR, the Panama Canal was the biggest thing that he had thought he had contributed. And as he wrote to John Hay, he thought it was the great bit of work of my administration, and from the material and constructive standpoint, one of the greatest bits of work that the 20th century will see. Well, you can argue about that, but he thought it was very important. And when he gave a speech in San Francisco in 1911, he explained it, how, at least in his mind, this all came about. Now, what I did was take possession of the isthmus, start the canal, and then let Congress debate me instead of the canal. So there's a lot of machinations about how the United States starts to build a canal in a foreign country that had only been a, a foreign country for a very small period, a short period of time. But, you know, this is TR kind of taking charge when he thinks, thinks that something is important. And of course, TR's involvement in the Panama Canal inspired cartoons and other visuals. So this one is called the First Spadeful, and it's showing TR like just actually digging the canal himself. Uh, and you can kind of see Co Bogota, Colombia in the back, and that's because there has to be a Panamanian uh, revolution against Colombia before the United States can come in and work on the canal. So that's what was going on with that cartoon. And you can always count on the periodical puck to put a humorous view on something. So instead of Roosevelt's rough diggers, these are Roosevelt's, or Roosevelt's rough riders become Roosevelt's rough diggers. And here again, he's leading them into the breach just with shovels instead of rifles. And you cannot mention TR and the Panama Canal without including this photograph of when TR actually went down to Panama in 1906 to see the canal under construction. And kind of like a, a, a small boy with a big, you know, with, with mo earth moving machinery, he had to get in the actual cab and try it out himself. And this is also documenting the first time that a sitting president left the United States for a foreign country as well. Now, here's another thing that TR was sort of interested in, and uh, he supported the idea of instituting new spelling conventions that eliminated unnecessary letters and words so that you could write things more efficiently. So in some ways, he's sort of doing text speak before there was texting. It's like, why spell out thoroughly when you can do something else? So instead, you can see this in an, an example of one of his, that's thoroughly washed with a little bit of, of modification. While the spelling conven convention never really took hold, it gave Secretary of State Elihu Root a chance to good-naturedly rib TR about this. So this is Elihu Root 
kind of making fun of TR with his simplified spelling. And what it says is, dear Theodore, please read this and get it back, ER. But TR and Root seem to have had enough of a good relationship that they could kind of be playful with one another. And after one grandiose letter uh, of congratulations to a foreign minister on the birth of their child, you know, when, when a queen or someone had a, had a child, you had to send these very elaborate congratulations. And so Root sent him this <clears throat> and scolded him for the difference between your treatment of this interesting and important topic and the letter written by you when His Royal American Highness, the Honorable James w. w. Wadsworth, Chairman of the Committee on Agriculture of the House of Representatives, was delivered of a beef bill. And the background is TR had been very critical of Wadsworth and his beef bill, so he had not uh, given him proper, uh, proper greetings. And TR could give it right back. So when you get into presidential papers, you get crank letters. And so this one is a crank letter that was sent to Theodore Roosevelt, T. Roosevelt, President, etc. You and that crooked fellow Root have wrecked this administration, signed X. Well, T.R. thought that was hilarious. He wrote on the bo bottom, ha ha, Root, ha ha, you are exposed, T.R., and send it to Root. So you find this in, in Elihu Root's papers instead. Now, TR made strong impressions on many people, but lunches at Sagamore Hill inspired at least two writers to record their observations of TR. So you might remember the previous speaker talked about Ray Stannard Baker. And this is one of, when, when Baker experienced a lunch at Sagamore Hill, he wrote to his father about it in 1903. And he said, yesterday I went over to Oyster Bay by invitation to lunch with the president. It was a most interesting occasion for me. We had not been there long before the president came in like a gust of wind, big, brawny, brown, clad in knickerbockers and old, and old gray, worn gray shirt and a disreputable tie and worn shoes. At table later, he told stories, talked business, laughed uproariously. He takes an extraordinary interest in life and gets pleasure out of everything. If it is an act of friendship, he enjoys that also. His mind seems to leap upon every question with boundless enthusiasm. He has a decision ready before his auditor has even had time to arrange his premises. And humorous Peter Finley Dunn, who wrote as a fictitious Irishman, Mr. Dooley, um, was struck by the multifaceted lunches at Oyster Bay. He says, I liked his dinner, but at his, his lunches, we had what we would call a bully time. Mr. Roosevelt named them dually lunches because once I described a gathering of baseball players, roller skaters, boxers, contortionists, and poets as his chosen company for meals. This was not quite true, but he did like to have amusing people around him at informal meals and was utterly indifferent as to their political position, their social standing, or their wealth. And at one lunch, uh, French ambassador Jules Jusserand and the TR got into a discussion of who actually authored Romeo and Juliet. And Jusserand started quoting lines of the play and said, who but Shakespeare could write you know, such beautiful words. So he's quoting all of this Romeo and Juliet. At this moment, a soldierly looking man across the table was heard to say to his neighbor, and I apologize for the slur here. The Japs have fine artillery. Their shrapnel is wonderful. I once saw a group of 20 men at Port Arthur actually disemboweled by one shell burst. What was that? What was that? The president cried, suddenly disemboweled? Remember, they're having lunch, and he's yelling about disemboweling. From that moment, he left Juliet speechless in the moon on the balcony while he and the major discussed across the table the nature of gunshot wounds in modern warfare. The ambassador rallied him slightly after lunch. I'm sorry, said the president. I didn't mean to break up our discussion of Shakespeare, but I was deeply interested in what the major said. He was one of our observers at Port Arthur, and Major Pershing brought him here. It makes little difference, said the Frenchman. There is quite as much bloodshed as love in Shakespeare, even in Romeo and Juliet. Now, whether at the White House or in Oyster Bay, the Roosevelts were always doing something. And just after becoming president in 1901, T.R. wrote to his friend, the writer Owen Wister, that he and Edith were trying to give their children as normal, a normal as life as possible now that they were under such a media glare in the White House. We spend no small part of our time in doing our best to prevent them from becoming self-conscious through being talked about. They lead exactly the lives led by any other six children who live in a roomy house with a garden and go to school, and they are on, on the whole pretty good and are not always good at all. And especially after Ted and Kermit were away at boarding school or at college, it was the baby of the family, Quentin, who provided the most colorful stories of the White House mischief. He was essentially the leader, ringleader of what they called the White House gang, and members had numerous adventures within the White House and around Washington. Now, 
uh, Quentin was perfectly capable, capable of his own hijinks, though. And this is a letter that TR tells his son Archie about the latest episode. And this is kind of one of my favorites, so you can sort of see what Quentin is up to in the White House. Before we left Oyster Bay, Quentin had collected two snakes. He lost one, which did not turn up again until an hour before departure, when he found it in one of the spare rooms. This one he let loose and brought the other one on to Washington, there being a variety of exciting adventures on the way, the snake wriggling out of his box once or being upset on the floor once. The first day home, Quentin was allowed not to go to school, but to go about and renew all of his friendships. Among other places that he visited was Schmidt's animal store, where he left his little snake. Schmidt presented him with three snakes, simply to pass the day with him, a large and beautiful and very friendly king snake and two little wee snakes. Quentin came hurrying back on his roller skates and burst into the room to show me the treasures. I was discussing certain matters with the attorney general at the time, and the snakes were eagerly deposited in my lap. The king snake, by the way, although most friendly with Quentin, had just been making a resolute effort to devour one of the smaller snakes. As Quentin and his menagerie were an interruption to my interview with the Department of Justice, I suggested that he go into the next room where four congressmen were drearily waiting until I should be at leisure. I thought he and his snakes would probably enliven their waiting time. He at once fell in with the suggestion and rushed up to the congressman with the assurance that he would there find kindred spirits. They at first thought the snakes were wooden ones, and there was some perceptible recoil when they realized that they were alive. Then the king's snake went up Quentin's sleeve. He was three or four feet long, and we hesitated to drag him back because his scales rendered that difficult. The last I saw of Quentin, one congressman was gingerly helping him off with his jacket so as to let the snake crawl out of the upper end of his sleeve. So that gives you a little taste of sort of, you know, the administrative offices in the White House with the Roosevelt children. But T.R. could be less amused by other antics of the White House gang, including this letter that he also wrote to his son, Archie, in which he describes taking Quentin to task for putting spitballs on all the portraits in the White House. I explained to them that they had acted like boars, that it would have been a disgrace to have behaved so in any gentleman's house, but that it was a double disgrace in the house of the nation. And so you can, as you can imagine, Quentin was grounded and not allowed to see his friends. In 1904, after he had won election in his own right, T.R. promised that he wasn't going to run for a second term of office, after, and he regretted that immediately, but he was good to his word, and he picked William Howard Taft as his successor, as you might see from this, this uh, cover of Puck. And I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead a few things, because I want to talk to you a little bit about what he does after the White House. All right. So... William Howard Taft is duly elected with a lot of support from TR and others in 1908. And so in 1909, TR is looking to, what, what does he do after he's in the White House? He's still a very young man. He doesn't have anything necessarily lined up. And so what he decides to do is to go on safari in Africa. That got him out of the country so that nobody said that he was trying to manipulate Taft. It gave him something to occupy his time. He was a naturalist. He was really interested in, in science and, and animals. And so he also used this as an expedition to collect specimens for the Smithsonian at the national, what is now the Natu National Museum of, Amer of Natural History. And he thought as an ex-president, anything that he collected should be part of the nation's museums. And that's what he's writing to, to the head of the Smithsonian about, is asking about getting taxidermists to go with him on this expedition to Africa and which he and his son, Quentin, duly go on for about a year from 1909 into 1910. Into 1910. And while they're there, they're hunting a whole lot of specimens. And, what he, and in this letter to Ted, he describes that they've shot giraffe, hyena, leopards, lions, rhinos, and hippos, among other things. So, and here are the two hunters with some of their specimens. So that's T.R. on the right and Kermit on the left. Now the other for, Wash for TR, he's really cut off while he's in Africa from some of the news. And he starts hearing rumors that Taft is undermining, or that at least the Taft uh, administration is undermining some of his conservation activities, some of his other progressive activities. And don't have time to go into it. Maybe you've gotten to this in your history books. There's a huge disagreement between TR's friend, Gifford Pinchot, who's the head of the Forest Service, the Secretary of the Interior, who's issuing some, um, who's putting some, some land leases out, and President Taft. Taft fires Gifford Pinchot, and Pinchot writes to TR in Africa to tell him that he's been fired. So this letter is actually from 
Teddy Roosevelt writing from Africa saying, we've just had a runner from the village to tell us that you've been fired. I can't believe that this is happening. So, you know, I'm having a hard time following things here in Africa, so I want to hear more about it. Sorry, that's a little bit washed out here. And then also you get the follow-up that Gifford Pinchot has written to him in Africa, and he says, it's a very ungracious thing for an ex-president to criticize the successor, yet I cannot, as an honest man, cease to battle for the principles for which you and I and Jim and Smith and Moody and the rest of our close associates stood. So if you know something about political history in the 1910s, when you start seeing these letters, you can see the breakup of the Republican Party in 1912 start to come. And even though TR was was still hoping that at that point that Taft would be reelected, he's already starting to have a lot of doubts about Taft and says that you know, he, although he was the most admirable lieutenant, he was not a particularly wise or efficient as a leader. So he's starting to criticize Taft. In 1912, ultimately TR entered the race when he didn't think that his progressive principles were being represented by the mainstream, cons the conservative mainstream of the Republican Party. So he's e even further out in advance of all these progressive issues. And so even though Taft is running as a, as a, a Republican, TR enters the race under the progressive or Bull Moose Party. And this is a campaign that becomes more like a crusade than just a political campaign. And in this speech in Chicago in 1912, you get a sense of that when he ends. We fight in honorable fashion for the good of mankind, fearless of the future, unheeding of our individual fates, with unflinching hearts and undimmed eyes. We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. Well, something kind of exciting happened in October of 1912 that TR was actually shot by a mentally disturbed man in Milwaukee. And you may have heard this story, but he's actually, he's, the bullet does go into him, as you can see from this x-ray here, but it slowed because TR had a, 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 a metal case for his eyeglasses and his rolled up speech in his pocket, and that slowed the bullet going into his body. So the moral of the story is it's good to be blind and verbose because your speech and your glasses may save your life. But the bullet did penetrate his chest, and despite the fact he's bleeding, he still went on stage and gave the whole address. But afterwards, he sent this telegram to Edith, and what I think is a master of understatement, he says, I think my speech was quite a success. I very earnestly beg you not to come out. I am not nearly as bad hurt as I have been again and again with a fall from my horse. Everything is being done for me. Well, of course, you know, you're Mrs. Roosevelt, and you receive something about your husband's been shot, and you go. Now, as was the case in 1909, TR went on another expedition in 1913, and this time he was part of an expedition to map the tributary of the Amazon River, and it was called the River of Doubt because nobody knew exactly where it went. So he's part of this expedition. And on one of the more interesting documents about this, this uh, in our collections about the River of Doubt exposition, expedition is this statement signed by pretty much every member of the expedition saying that the elderly father Zom who had organized it but was um, let's say not robust enough to go on such an expedition they felt that he was he was kind of weighing them down and TR writes every American of the ex or every member of the expedition has told me that in his opinion it is essential to the success and well-being of the expedition that Father Zom should at once leave it and return to the settled country so essentially this is the document that says sorry Father Zom you're out of here and it's signed by all the members of the expedition now when World War I broke out, TR was eager for the United States to join the fight. And when the United States entered the war in April 1917, TR wanted to join the fight himself. So he's kind of back in his 1898 Spanish-American War days, thinking that he can just get a regiment of Rough Riders together and go off to Europe. So he sends a telegram to the current president, Woodrow Wilson, asking if he can uh, raise two divisions immediately and send them to the front. And this is in May of 17, and the United States had only joined in April. Well, Woodrow Wilson, for a host of political and logistical reasons, basically writes back to TR and says, well, thanks, but no thanks. We can't, we can't take your regiments. Because for one thing, you can't have Theodore Roosevelt running around in Europe, probably. So. TR was incredibly disappointed, angry, and frustrated by the President Wilson's refusal to let him go, and it's very evident in his correspondence how, how much, how angry he was about all of this, that you know, he could give speeches, but the inactivity really rankled him. He said, 
He could give some speeches, but the president by his action has deprived me of the power of making my appeal effective. In my case, my words count because I am a man of action, and the president has refused to let me take part in this great contest as a man of action. But you can always count on William Allen White, his friend and newspaper editor, to kind of put a humorous spin on things. Even though he sympathized with TR and his, his annoyance at not being able to go, he, he um, made an allusion to Wilson's famous 1916 campaign slogan of, he kept us out of war by quipping, there is this to save the president, he kept you out of the war. So my guess is TR probably didn't think that was very funny. Uh, sorry, this one's a little washed out too. But if you're the son or son-in-law of Theodore Roosevelt, you, and you cannot not go to war if you're able to. So TR pulled strings to be able to allow all of his sons to have some participation in World War I. And m most of them were injured at some point. But in asking his friend Springing for a favor so that his son Kermit could go to war somewhere, TR offered, whether their mother and their wives and I will ever see them again or not, of course, none of us can tell. And as it turned out, the baby, Quentin, was the one who didn't come back. Quentin became a pilot in the first, the first war that involved airplanes, and he was shot down behind German lines. As a result, in the TR papers, you can see a succession of telegrams and letters uh, from, of condolence that started pouring in from around the country and around the world. And some of them were just everyday Americans who sympathized with the family. Others were more famous, like um, actress Sarah Bernhardt. So if you know a little theater history, she might be recognizable. Or future uh, president Calvin Coolidge, who was then the acting governor of Massachusetts. And, and also William Howard Taft, who although TR and Taft had ceased to be friends in 1912, uh, they sympathized with one another and after they kind of came back together over, partially over their shared hatred of Woodrow Wilson. But Taft's son, Charlie, had been part of that White House gang that had been putting spitballs on the paintings and, and such. So despite the outpouring of support, TR was crushed by Quentin's death and he was heard to say, poor Quinnykins, on more than one occasion. So after uh, years of health issues exacerbated by the Amazon trip, uh, during which he almost died, TR's heart could not take another blow. So the old lion died peacefully at his home at Sagamore Hill on Dis January 6, 1919. And so in Kermit's papers, we have a whole series of letters that the Roosevelt's wrote to one another about this, in, uh, uh, this event. So his mother wrote to Kermit describing how TR died very peacefully. In Kermit's papers, uh, um, he, says, he writes to his mother that father somehow seems very near and is it, as if he would never be far. I don't feel sorry for him. He wouldn't want it. That would be the last thing. There was never anyone like him, and there won't be. So for Kermit, his world had sort of dropped out. And Archie suggested that perhaps this wasn't the worst thing for TR, that he wouldn't have wanted to live in terms of suffering and physical burdens that wouldn't have allowed him to be active. And of course, Ethel, his, the sister, expressed a similar thought. It seems as if the whole world had stopped, as if the mainspring of our own life was broken. Now in 1934, William Allen White addressed the Theodore Roosevelt Association. He recalled both his first meeting with TR when they were young men, as well as their last meeting when he visited TR in the hospital not long before his death. And while TR died peacefully at home, White described his vision of how TR moved from this world into the next, and that strikes me as just kind of right for TR. So how he describes it is, finally standing at the bed, we clasped both hands and said farewell. I am glad to have that last fine memory of him. The hour of turmoil in the room and the recollection of the tumultuous uproar that he must have caused that day to bring me to his bedside. Not that it was for me, but because I shall always know that he went clear to the end of his day, time like Kipling's Fuzzy Wuzzy, a first class fighting man. There was no twilight or ev an evening star for him. He plunged headlong, snorting into the breakers of the tide that swept him to another born, full armed, breasting the waves, a small, a strong swimmer, undaunted. And I will just leave you with my favorite puck cover of Theodore Roosevelt because this is how I always think of him as someone, and the, you might be able to see that the caption is labeled vacation. So this is what TR does while he's on vacation. 
So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take some questions. So anybody have any questions about, yes? I don't recall that he was. Um, it's definitely something that comes afterwards because when you look at drawing the color line in Mississippi, and, and the story of, of that is that T.R. goes hunting in Mississippi, and I think it's 1903, if I'm, cr if I'm correct, and they're not having a good day of hunting, and so the people that he's with essentially kind of find a scraggly bear and they tie it up and say, here, here's something that you can shoot at, and he, he refuses to do that because that's unsportsmanlike. As I understand that the bear was dispatched anyway, but not by TR. So that becomes a, cam, a, becomes a cartoon of drawing the, the, the line in Mississippi. And it has multiple levels to it because it's, here's this man who is not going to be unsportsmanlike and, and shoot this mangy bear that's been tied up. But it's also the bear is black and TR is white and Mississippi is a very segregated state. And so there's some you know, kind of segregation issues on that too. And Clifford Berryman is the one who drew that cartoon. And the bear, that the little kind of mangy bear, becomes this cute little, this little bear that gets tied up to the tree in his, his illustrations. And so that helps kind of make, uh, uh, make popular the idea of Teddy as a bear. And that's what gives rise to the teddy bear that a company markets. So then at least after that one, because of course that becomes a fairly famous cartoon, Berriman really starts putting that little bear in a lot of his, his illustrations. And sometimes when you're in collections and you find things that Clifford Berryman has written to somebody, it's, I remember seeing one once that it's just uh, saying he can't come to a dinner party or something, he'll draw the little bear. So that becomes very synonymous with him too. Any other questions? Well, if you don't have questions, one thing I do want to, if you are at all interested in Theodore Roosevelt, or you have assignments that you have to go use primary sources, because I see a lot of high school and college students, which you probably, probably have to do, want to let you know that our Theodore Roosevelt papers are online. They're from the microfilm edition, so, you know, because that allows us to do large collections more cost effectively. But we have a number of presidential papers online, uh, so this is a way that you can get to some of those documents. We also have a finding aid for Theodore Roosevelt's hunting library. So we don't have the books online, but this will let you know what books were part of his hunting library and what came to the Library of Congress. We also have a website. It's Theodore Roosevelt, His Life and Times on Film. So if you're interested in seeing any of those silent films of his inauguration or some of the River of Doubt trip, you can go online and, and see some of those films and audio. If you need photographs as part of your, your, your projects, the Princeton Photographs online catalog is a great way to at least get started, whether it's Theodore Roosevelt or another image. And you can go on there, and most of the images are available for downloading in a variety of formats. So that's something that you can use as primary sources. And we also have a great website called Chronicling America that is it hosts a number of historic, uh, historic newspapers that are keyword searchable. And they're provided to us by our state partners, so the state partners decide which, which cities and, and are represented and, and which titles. But if you're looking for something that's available to you 24-7 for free at home that gets you into historic newspapers that are copyright free, that's a great place to go to. So even if you weren't interested in, in you know, what we were talking about today, here's something that at least you can, you can use for some of your, your projects in the future too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, and there's a, a tremendous amount of stuff available online. Uh, there is also Dickinson State University, which is digitalizing lots of his papers uh, and is uh, searchable and so on. Uh, and I think as you go through your high school career for the high school students here and on to college, you're going to learn more and more about how to do that and how to either trust it or not trust it, uh, figuring out different things. I think one of the great lessons to learn is that a lot of people think history 
is definable and it's either the way it was or you know that people are kind of lying about it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that history is very unclear, constantly changing, more and more information coming forward, people's views chasing, changing about different things. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's see, I have a couple of comments about the teddy bear. I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm Professor Tweed Roosevelt here at LIU. I'm a great-grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and so I've had a lot, I've learned a lot about it. Uh, the teddy bear was an interesting story because this came completely accidentally. Nobody had ever heard of a teddy bear. It's hard to believe, but nobody had ever heard of a teddy bear. Or there had never been another kind of plush animal that had any relationship to that. And not only that, plush animal, in other words, soft animals, didn't exist. So kids played with hard dolls or hard animals. And so this was kind of a whole new thing. Well, T.R. hated the idea. He didn't think a teddy bear was the kind of image that he wanted. He, he was a bull moose guy, but he, and he kind of sort of denigrated it for a while, but uh, uh, it overwhelmed him. It became so popular, and is still, of course, popular. Who, I mean, is there anybody in this room who hasn't had a teddy bear, at least one? Uh, and uh, <coughs> so uh, there was nothing anybody could do to stop that wave. Uh, <clears throat> another comment of something that was mentioned here is, is the war record of, of Theodore Roosevelt's children. And uh, Quentin Roosevelt was mentioned. He was a pilot in the First World War. Remember, this is just the beginning of airplanes. And the p planes were open, and they would shoot at each other with pistols. Uh, and they would fly over something and drop a little bomb on it. Uh, it was extremely dangerous. And just think about this, you're volunteering to be a pilot uh, in the First World War, we were all volunteers, you were trained, you went to the front, and you got into dogfights, and the average life expectancy of a, pirate, of a pilot on the front line was measured in weeks, like three or four weeks. Uh, it really kind of heart-stopping when you think of brave people who are willing to do that. Uh, <coughs> And there's a lot more about TR's uh, uh, military career, which anybody interested, you can look it up. This is the wind-up of our uh, conference. It's been a three-day conference. Some of you have been to most of it, or even all of it. Some of you only to little sections. We're delighted that uh, the students have come, the high school students and other. We hope you found it useful. Uh, let me tell you a little about the Institute, because as you're now beginning to think about, or I don't know where you are in the process of where you want to go to college, uh, we of course offering LIU as, a, as a, a place you might want to consider, and the Institute, which will be uh, working closely with student interns, giving them all kinds of exciting things to be involved with, and the Institute isn't just about Theodore Roosevelt, it's about what he stood for and what he was interested in. So some of the major aspects of, the, of this institute will be involved in major issues of the day, some of which I'm sure concern you. For example, climate change and global warming and all those issues. We want to be a, a, a major player and talker in that. And it's really an opportunity for students to get involved and make a difference. Uh, you may feel that, uh, you know, what can you do as a student in high school or in, in college? It turns out you can do a lot. And we have lots of examples that some I personally participated in of what young people and students can do to change the system. And sometimes uh, unintended consequences. Uh, I personally happen to have worked on, the, on a process for trying to bring presidential primaries into being the main way that we picked presidential candidates. Uh, it was, believe it or not, in, in the 60s before that, most presidential candidates were basically chosen by the par party bosses, and the uh, uh, primary system didn't really come in until the 70s and 80s. Uh, and we're now seeing some of the unintended consequences of what happens in a primary system. And there are some very serious issues 
that we will be facing in presidential elections. I know you, you've all heard about the fake news and Russian meddling and all that, but there are other very serious and dangerous sort of situations. In this country, we have typically had two parties, each of which, of whom, or which, I guess, each of which puts up a candidate. And whichever candidate wins under the rules, which have to do with various aspects of, of the intricacies of a national election, becomes president. There's been talk about third party candidates. TR was a third party candidate, but there's never been a race where the third party candidates have been anything but spoilers. So you have people like Ross Perot, who, who uh, was a third party candidate and, and kind of spoiled the election for the front winner so the other side win, won. So you have the situation where you have third party candidates, they're not very, they don't get a lot of votes, but they may get enough to siphon off so that whichever party they're more likely to be related to loses. So that's a fairly simple situation. But we could easily develop into a situation where you have, well you see what's happening now in the, on the Democratic side, they have you know, 15, 18, 20 candidates and they're all in the process of kind of winnowing them down and eventually we'll get to one, whoever that is, and I'm sure you all have your favorites on that. But what happens if people start running third parties, in other words, or fourth parties, or fifth parties, or sixth parties? So what happens if you go into an election and you're confronted with six different people running for president? of kind of all stripes, all the way over to so say some, what I would call crazy party might be, you know, uh, something about animal rights, not the normal animal rights, but the way all, oh, and animal rights kind of crowd. So you have eight, nine, ten people running for president. And when the election is over, nobody gets more than 20% of the vote. And the party that sort of the mainline crowd divide up all the votes, and you could wind up with a president who's from some crazy faction, faction on the side. We have no idea how we would deal with that now. That could just happen. And the Constitution isn't clear about it. The party systems aren't clear about it. What would the courts say? Uh, we're in an extremely dangerous time from that perspective, whatever you believe in. And so we're hoping this institute and others can begin to think about th these kinds of problems and think about what we're going to do if we're suddenly presented with them. And the people that will be thinking about it will not be just the professors and thought leaders, but a lot of them will be students who are involved in it and are involved in this process It really can make a difference. So I want you to think about you know, where you want to go in life and how much of it you want to, how much of your life you want to focus on doing things for other people. Part of that is through the political structure. You can dedicate your life to it, and many people do, but also, no matter what you do when you go on in the world, become an accountant or a doctor or a business person or whatever, uh, you can carve off part of your uh, time to do these kinds of things. So I hope you'll think about that. Uh, I don't really have anything else to say, except that it's been a great three days for all of us and a great day today. I'm, del I'm delighted and encouraged by seeing all these young people, many of whom are interested in where we're going, and we will be here to help you as we go on. So thank you very much, and we'll have another one a couple of years, a year or so. So goodbye. <laughs>